the case. Everybody knows that we're recording now. Um, <laughs> so you guys are starting to do continuous probability distributions, whereas last week you were doing um, discrete probability distributions. So um, Kayla, I'll get to number 12. I'm going to get to like all the problems related to area under the curve and then um, vice versa. So this week is actually not that bad. You're going to be happy because with the calculator trick, it makes it really easy. It makes it really fast, but you got to know at least what is happening. <laughs> so you're on your probability distributions, but last week we saw a lot of probability distributions related to tables. Um, I think maybe Dr. Tammy showed a little bit of a visual in her topic session with binomial, but it makes, um, I think a bit more common here when we get to normal distribution. Um, you've seen this. You've seen this. You've seen this thing. And obviously I didn't draw it perfectly, but whatever. You've seen this thing. We talk about it. We have talked about it a few times. The normal distribution curve. You're going to see it a lot now. Um, so a little bit of a review about the normal distribution curve. Obviously the center is the mean. Also the mean and the median. The mean is equal to the median, which is equal to the mode. That's and then, um, you know, if you guys uh, saw any of my videos of the empirical rule, you might um, remember that, you know, that the majority of the data values are within two and three standard deviations of the mean. And the mean is always the center of this kind of curve. And it depends on whether we're doing like population mean or sample mean. Um, I'll probably use population mean notation a lot more today. Um, and then, you know, one standard deviation above the mean is, you know, mu plus one standard deviation and so on and so forth. Two standard deviations, three standard deviations. So this, this is kind of like referring to the empirical rule a bit that I did in my other videos, but I don't think we do it so much in the assignments here. But anyway, <clears throat> the most important thing for this week is that the total area under the curve is equal to one. And so that means that area is, uh, there's a relationship between area and probability. Your area under the curve for your continuous, this is the continuous probability distribution, is how you find your probability or percentage. So if you have a continuous probability distribution, which you guys will have your normal distribution stuff, if you're asked for probability or if you're asked for percentage, then you're going to basically find area under a curve. So since this is not a basic, a typical type of curve, and I think maybe you've seen um, uniform distribution in the beginning. I guess there's not a lot of questions about uniform distribution, so I'm just going to go straight to this. Um, to find the area under the curve, you're going to need to either use calculus, which we don't do, or a calculator trick. Or sometimes what we used to do is use tables. Um, some of the students use tables. I think maybe the book talks about tables too. You know, everything is preference, but I'm going to show you with the calculator. So <clears throat> the first type of distribution that you need to know is the standard normal distribution. And the standard normal distribution, SND, I'm going to talk about, or I'm going to write SND, um, is particular to the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So when you're on an SND curve, a standard normal distribution curve, it's a standard curve. I'm going to always label it SND so that you know that if I ever have a normal distribution curve and I label SND, automatically the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So the center of this is zero. And one standard deviation above the mean would be positive one and two standard deviations above the mean would be positive two. And so on and so forth. And let me check the chat real quick. OK, hold on, somebody is trying to get in. Let me share. All right, give me a second. I don't want anyone to. Let me put the link in this. 
One second. I thought I... I don't know. I don't know if I'm today. Okay. Just in case. Because last week there was like a mix up and for some reason the calendar wasn't working. So I had to make up my own like session for that week. Okay. So <clears throat> back to this um, standard normal distribution curve. The mean is zero. The standard deviation is one. So the center of the curve is zero because the center of a normal distribution curve is always the mean. One standard deviation above the mean is positive one. Two standard deviations above the mean positive two. So on and so forth, one standard deviation below the mean, negative one, two below, three below. And the, the horizontal scale goes forever in both directions. It goes to negative infinity and it goes to positive infinity. But you can see the bulk of the area lies within three standard deviations of the mean from three below to three above. So the bulk of it is here because obviously you have little area in each of these tails, as we call them. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the curve stops. It does go forever in both directions. But I'm not going to draw forever, right? Um, <laughs> let me just make sure. OK, so <clears throat> uh, uh, an important term you're going to hear a lot is. Um, OK, I finish it is um, z-score. So <clears throat> a z-score is a standard standardized value which represents the amount of standard deviations away from a mean that a data value lies. So if a z-score is positive one, then that data value <clears throat> lies one standard deviation above the mean. If a z-score is negative two, then that data value lies two standard deviations below the mean. So there's a little formula to calculate z-scores x minus mu over sigma. This is always, you know, your typical calculation of z-squared. X is your data value, mu is your mean, and then standard deviation. And it just, you know, it depends on the situation. A lot of this is like area. So I'm going to go straight to kind of like finding the area. If I want to, if you guys want me to go into more detail about that, I will. But I want you to remember that the horizontal scale on a standard normal distribution curve are basically z-scores. So if I ever talk about a z-score, I'm automatically on a standard normal distribution curve and my mean is automatically zero, my standard deviation is automatically one, and vice versa. If I'm on a standard normal distribution curve, my horizontal scale is automatically z-scores, and this is true. Or if I tell you this is true and I'm normally distributed, I'm automatically standard, I'm automatically z score. So they all go hand in hand, right? So I don't always have to tell you I'm on a standard normal distribution curve as long as I talk about z-scores. So um, let me do a couple of examples. So you guys have different scenarios. I'm going to do three examples first of finding the area under the curve. Finding the area under the curve. Um, I'm going to say standard normal distribution, <clears throat> which means that the center is zero, that the mean is zero, and the standard deviation is one, um, and that I have z-scores along the horizontal scale automatically. <clears throat> I'm probably going to do three of these, actually. Three different scenarios, OK? Now I'm doing it where you're like the picture is given to you, so that's wonderful. It's not always given to you, but we'll do that after. So let's assume, and this is the notation you might see, find the probability that Z is greater than 2.5, right? This is the notation that you might see. So this is the same notation as last week, probability. <clears throat> find the probability that you randomly choose one z-score and it's bigger than 2.5. So let's do this first example here. Um, so uh, color coding, we'll do green. 2.5 is a positive z-score, so it's going to be the right of the center. And if I want a probability, then I want the area under the curve. So either you can have the picture, the direct picture, 
Let me make sure these people got in. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I will, Kayla. Okay. Um, a couple people still like in the wrong area. So if I want the probability that a z-score is greater than 2.5, I want the area. Anytime you're asked for probability with this type of continuous distribution, um, you're looking for the area under the curve. So the area is your probability, it is your percentage or whatever, okay? So z greater than that would be everything to the right of it because this is a horizontal scale going from least to greatest. So if I want to go um, greater than that, everything to the right. So I'm going to draw my picture. So this is basically finding the area to the right of this 2.5 value. And we're on a standard normal distribution curve. When you want to find area under a curve, you are going to use what we call normal CDF. Now, normal CDF is found in the same location um, as your um, binomial. So you're still above bars, you're still on distribution. So we're still gonna go second bars. You're gonna find, like I said before, a lot of the stuff that you do is within stat or vars. Those are the two buttons, your favorite buttons. For now, we're still in vars. So second and vars is where I pull up distribution and normal CDF on mine is number two, should be number two on yours too. Last time we went, last week we went all the way down to binomial, right? We're not doing binomial anymore. Right now we're finding area under a standard normal distribution curve. And so we want normal CDF. When you click normal CDF, you're gonna see this is what they ask you for. They ask you for lower, upper, the mean and the standard deviation. So the lower and the upper is basically bounding your area. Basically it's asking you between what two values do you want to find this area for? So in this particular case, because it's a standard normal distribution curve, it's between what two z-scores? So <clears throat> I'm gonna write this out, normal CDF, my lower bound. Now, I want the area to the right of this. So the lowest part of the area has a z-score of 2.5. So my lower bound is gonna be positive 2.5. Now my upper bound might be a little bit more difficult let me write this lower 2.5 comma my upper bound is going to be a little more difficult because this goes to positive infinity right so what we're going to use to represent positive infinity because as i said um the area as i continue this direction is going to be extremely small so if i use a huge positive number to represent positive infinity it's going to basically give me my my um, my area my proper area so to represent positive infinity, um, we're using scientific notation. You can actually use a big positive number and type it in too, but some people like to use this because it represents one times 10 to the 99, which is a huge positive number. I used to tell my students just to put like a huge positive number, right? But um, this is good to show too, because you can, you know, this is a really big positive number. 1 times 10 to the 99. So how I input this is I obviously put 1. The E on the calculator is on top of the comma. You see EE. E. So I always press second and then the comma to get E, which is my scientific notation. And then positive 99. So I'm bounding my area. My lower bound is positive 2.5. And my upper bound is positive infinity, which is going to be represented by this huge positive number. So those are, my, you know, I'm basically asking for the area between these two numbers. My mean, because I'm on a standard normal distribution curve, and I know that because of the z-score, my mean is going to be zero, and my standard deviation is one, which is already there for me, and then pace. And you'll see it goes in order. It goes normal CDF, lower bound, upper bound, mean and standard deviation. Lower bound, upper bound, mean and standard deviation and then enter and it gives me that area 0 0.0062 rounding to four 
approximately 0 0.0062. Okay, so I go, I'm on my homework, um, and I think what, uh, what was asked at number 12 is exactly like this. Area to the right, um, find the area of the shaded region with a given z-score, and it happens to be area to the right. So you um, normal CDF when you're finding area, or if you're asked for probability, which is represented in this notation as well, probability is area. So if you're asked for probability, find your area, and then bound it, lower bound, upper bound. You're basically telling the calculator between these two values, this is the area that I want. Okay, so in, in this particular situation, I'm going back to the chat on here too. In this particular situation, my lower bound was 2.5 and my upper bound was basically positive infinity, but positive infinity um, was represented by 1E99. Okay, so do you have any questions so far? Um, Oh, okay, well, I'll show you something with that, okay? Um, when I get into inverse norm, I'll show you. <clears throat> right now for just area, I'll do that after. So <clears throat> for this particular situation, let's assume that I'm asked to find the probability that I randomly choose one z-score and it's less than, I don't know, less than 0 0.25, okay? So I'm asked for probability Automatically, I go, all right, I'm on a standard normal distribution curve because I have a z-score that's discussed. So I'm on a standard normal distribution curve where the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. Okay, if you guys don't have that, I'm going to show you how you could do it without that too. Yeah, I'll stay. I'm recording it, so I'll, I'll save it. Um, so, all right, so here's positive z-score 0.25. And I'm asked for probability, which means I'm asked for area. And if I want less than, I'm asked for the area to the left. So I'm drawing my figure if I don't have it drawn for me. It makes it easier to draw it, right? <clears throat> so given that I'm looking for area, that means that I want normal CDF, right? And now I'm going to go to my calculator and clear this out. Press second bars and go to normal CDF. And basically, again, I'm going to be bounding my area between these two values, right? I have to tell it. I'm going to clear those out, right? Because I have different values. So my lower value, though, is negative infinity. And being that my lower value is negative infinity, I need to either put a large negative number here as my lower bound to represent that negative infinity, or we can use negative 1 E99 which is another scientific notation, a negative one times 10 to the 99. So that's, <laughs> that's negative one with 99 zeros after it, if you remember scientific notation. Either one is gonna work, whether you put a large negative number with a, you know, a bunch of zeros, you could do that, <laughs> or negative one, and then E is found above comma, so second comma, and then 99. So that's my lower bound for this particular example. Right, I'm bounding between here and here. My upper bound is positive 0.25. And it doesn't matter these values, you know, it could be positive z-score, negative z-score, you're still bounding between two values. Um, because it's a z-score, my, my mean is zero, my standard deviation is one, you'll find later that this will change because we'll, we'll be on a different type of distribution, not normal. Normal CDF, lower bound, upper bound, right, standard deviation. And then, yeah, so my lower bound, I'm writing this for your notes, 1E99, negative 1E99, 0 0.25 upper bound, 0 mean, standard deviation 1, and I get approximately 0.5987. Okay. So, <clears throat> so again, I'm stressing, I'm stressing it for a reason. Probability is your area. If I have a z-score, I'm on a standard normal distribution curve. If I want the probability that a z-score is between negative 2 and positive 3.1, negative 2 is approximately here, 
to the left of the center because I'm on a standard normal distribution curve and the center is zero. Positive 3.1 is like here. And I want to, to find the probability that I randomly choose a z-score between these two values. So now I'm going in between two numbers, right? So we did area to the right, area to the left, now area between. This is actually probably the easiest one. So <clears throat> I go, all right, cool. I'm looking for probability, which means I'm looking for, um, oops. I'm looking for probability, which means I'm looking for area. And anytime I'm looking for area, I use normal CDF. And I'm stressing this for a reason. You'd be surprised how many people forget this after this week. So second bars, back to normal CDF. I mean, you're gonna use normal CDF so much, you're gonna get sick of it, especially this week. But there's one thing that I want you to remember <clears throat> is that we're gonna use it again later on. And sometimes people forget normal CDF versus what I'm gonna show you after this. Don't forget it understand what you're doing. I'm looking for an area because I can't do calculus, right? I need tricks. So either we use tables or we use a graphing calculator or other programs that's going to give us that area. So you guys are using your graphing calculator to give you this area. You're specifically on a standard normal distribution curve. I want to bound this area, lower bound. My lower bound would be between where? My lower bound would be negative two, this one's even easier because I don't have to figure out infinity. My positive value, or it doesn't have to be positive, but my upper bound is 3.1. And then my mean is zero, standard deviation is one because I'm on a standard normal distribution curve. And I get 0 0.97, 0 0.9763 rounded, approximately 0.9763. So, um, this is basically how you find your area under your standard, uh, under your normal distribution curve. This is particular to standard normal distribution curve because we're talking about z scores and mean is zero, standard deviation is one. And this is a standard curve that, I mean, I would show you reasons why we use this too, but I wanna do stuff on the assignment. So we'll figure out if we have time after, but um, you know, a lot of times when we're comparing two things that have different means and standard deviations, you know, uh, a typical example that I've seen is like comparing ACT scores to SAT scores. They have completely different scoring um, like rules, but we can standardize both of them and then compare whether one um, score is better than another. You know, like let's say a 1200 on an SAT versus a 29 on an ACT. How do I know which score is, is more respectable or, or better, you know, on a scale? Well, I have to standardize both of those and then I can compare the two. So this is a standard scale that we can use, bring everything here, and then we can compare z-scores and that would help us, you know, decipher between two situations that are different. Okay, wait, so let me stop the recording for a second and see if you guys